Oh, that's right, Sweaties. What's up? I'm at the wrong camera. What? It's a live <laughs> show. It's Heroes 103. I'm John Schnapp. Thanks for joining us. We've got a packed, fun Heroes episode today. We're going to talk about heroes and villains and all things craziness involving superheroes. Joining me over here, we got Rob Meyer for Brunette. What's Hello up, Robert? Hello there. How did you, uh, did you guys have a good time at WonderCon this weekend? I did, man. I got a bunch of uh, really cool, like I got the alien space jockey, little mini, little statue thing. I got a bunch of comics. You did know? you see that 40-inch Mobius model of the Discovery from 2001? I did. It's it pretty amazing. It kind of made me feel the yeah. way that ship looks, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> oh, damn. That's right. <laughs> Time to get that model. You know, you know who else is fully aroused right now? It's Jeremy Johns, oh, ladies and gentlemen. 100% of the time. I mean, how can I not be with a panel like this, my friends? How you doing? Every time that Heroes logo comes up, I think of uh, Heroes, the show. I vision that. <laughs> music you know coming on i don't know why that's all i had because i didn't have a phallic ship at comic-con hey not everybody has phallic ships but some people have david griffin ladies and gentlemen ah, he's here i had a bookmark i got a bookmark with the five captains from the star trek series nice, nice. Yeah, oh, nice. very and cool i also got that's a bookmark with yoda i was like i could use a bookmark and lo and behold there were bookmarks I like nerd it. bookmarks. I love nerd that bookmarks is, are the only way. Yeah. You know what I like to bookmark on my Twitter is the incredible, fantastic fan art that keeps showing up. Mm -hmm. I wanted to pop up a couple, two more uh, from our hundredth episode where you guys went ahead and visualized the Collider team as superheroes. So there we are, and that's from this I is believe, Michael Downey. Michael Downey rocked yeah, that fantastic. one. That's incredible. Yeah. Us busting out of the set, and then the next one. He's Matt-tastic, right? Yeah, Matt Mitchell. Yep. Yeah, he's a really good artist. These are fantastic. Wow. You guys are really killing it. Just keep bringing them on. And you know who uh, skimped out a little early because we had to make some room? Jeremy Johns. You, oh. He was part of the 100th show. I was, briefly. Now, what would your superhero name be? Oh, my God. Like, uh, I am... I am the worst at hey think of something go you know so uh, um, I I does it have to be new or old it can be what I, I'm gonna name you you're the puzzler I'm the pu <laughs> that's that's actually a person is it is that already in a DC I think he no. was pre pre Riddler wasn't he's, he's one of Pace Pod's Pete's buddies oh geez. yeah <laughs> God damn how do you know Pod Pete <laughs> the official mascot of that's Collider right. Heroes Pace I'm the condiment king right. no not condiments like condoms that taste like mints I'm the condiment what about, king what about the glue master. Ooh, do I sniff glue or put it on my hand and peel it off? Or maybe like a lizard? you put things back together. Ooh, yes, Ooh, I'm the right. putter back together. I'm the <laughs> I'm the king of Seattle. I'm the schmodown king of Seattle. Hang on a second, there can be only one king of Sh of Seattle, and there's two of them right here. You guys are going to be kicking it off of this inner geekdom championship. We are it's part of the schmodown. It's two people from Seattle. You guys. Your friends here on the show, Absolutely. but you're going to be enemies when it's coming to this inner geekdom, right? Well, we're also hot toys connoisseurs. Yeah, that's true. Yes, absolutely. It's very true. And we're we both are. from Seattle. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. However, you know, I think my age, my experience, and my spicy good taste <laughs> is what is going to carry me to victory over this young, <laughs> handsome man right here. Well, Robert, I've got to say, you know, it's like it's it's pretty even. But if Jeremy Johns gets a couple of those Harry Potter questions, you might be going mm. down in a big giant. thing. It is smoke. true. That's my weakness. But I've been I've been uh, studying up. Okay, Ooh. I'm going to get my SAT scores on Harry Potter up nice. there because I need to get into an Ivy League. Hogwarts. Bam. You, know what I'm you got to study up on that Star Trek son, because you guys are going to be head to head. You, you know, know what's funny is because uh, your your weakness is Harry Potter. My weakness, I'm not telling you because I wouldn't do that. So I know what one of your weaknesses is. I know what what uh, I know what mine are. But you don't. I'll say this though: Robert Meyer Burnett is definitely a powerhouse. And if there's anybody that you need to fear when going into the schmodown, I will promise you, it's. Rachel Cushing for sure <laughs> and she's great and I imagine inevitably one day we'll I'll go up against her when I tear through him like tissue paper so it'll be great. really really wow. words from Seattle <laughs> well guys to be continued. Schmo, Schmo land to be continued check it out it'll be coming up soon the inner geekdom championship right now we're going to rock right into our very first story and that is Batgirl is coming that's right <laughs> The new DCEU is in full announcement news as Joss Whedon is going to be writing and directing the brand new Batgirl for the DCEU. This is going to be based off the new 52 Batgirl, so after dealing with her injuries at the hands of the Joker post-Oracle. What do you guys think about having Joss playing in the world of DC? Let's start with you, David. It's got to change up DC's palette. 
I mean, in a lot of different ways, in terms of mood, coloring. I mean, Josh is much more playful, yeah. uh, colorful. I mean, we saw it in the Avengers. I mean, I go back, of course, to his TV days. I was a huge Firefly fan. Mm -hmm. Even Dollhouse, which I know didn't do as well on television, that was still an entertaining show. Right. And I love his banter. Some people think it's all over the top, you know, it's a lot of quick, hey, hey, hey kind of things, a lot of very jokey, mm -hmm. but that could be fun. It'd be interesting to see him bring his style into the Batman verse, or also if he changes up his style a little bit, maybe goes in a different direction from what we've seen him in the past. He's a great writer. I love his dialogue. Mm -hmm. And so I'm excited to see how he's going to bring that into the Batman universe. Yeah, that's one of his biggest strengths is his ability to tell a story and also tell engaging stories about women. Robert, <laughs> what are your thoughts? Well, you know, what excites me about this is that I'm a big Buffy and Angel fan. Oh, yeah. Um, 20 years since Buffy debuted. Unreal. But <laughs> And look, I loved Age of Ultron. I mean, I loved Avengers, but I also loved Age of Ultron. A lot of people didn't. I think he's got a great take on this kind of material. What I like is that Batgirl, by definition, is not going to be coming up against some world apocalyptic you know, extinction event right. that faces the human race. I mean, this is going to have to be more along the lines of a dollhouse. Mm -hmm. I mean, like what he did with Eliza Dushku's character, I can see that being what he's going to do with Barbara Gordon. It's got to be... It's got to be a toned down set in Gotham, I would imagine, maybe another city, but probably Gotham, where it's got to be a much more human story. I'd like to see sort of, I don't want to compare him to Jessica Jones, like what Jessica Jones, what they did, right. but in terms of having a, a really female-centric storyline that really dealt with, with the issues women face in, in modern cities today, indeed everywhere, mm -hmm. I thought Jessica Jones was really sort of progressive television, mm -hmm. and I think we're going to get that from him with a DC character. I don't know. Is it going to be part of the DCEU? I, I don't know. Oh, yes, it is. And you know what? I'm, fun, I'm glad you brought that up because this would be a great way to introduce Gotham City Sirens and Batgirl and have them both part of Gotham and both interacting with each other. I'd love to see Batgirl in Gotham City Sirens, and I'd love to see Harley Quinn and Poison Ivy and Catwoman in Batgirl. I'd like to see that happen. Hopefully it can. Obviously, they're all part of the same cinematic universe. Jeremy, what are your thoughts about Joss yeah, Whedon? Yeah, I mean, Joss Whedon, I, I'm a fan of Joss Whedon, too. I'm glad you brought up Dollhouse, man, because that was one I was like, yeah, Dollhouse was great. And I know people are like, no, it wasn't. I'm like, did you see the episode Epitaph 1? Did you see that? They're like, no, well, you should. So, I mean, I and uh, going back to Buffy, I, I feel like Joss Whedon and James Cameron were writing the strong female leads before there was a call for it, you sure. know? And so, I mean, these guys are like the OG pioneers of that, you know? So I'm glad that he's in it, but you're right. That will change the palette. He is, he has more quips in what he writes per what we've seen in the DC cinematic universe thus far. So is that going to change everything? Is it just going to change the feel of this one thing that's a part of a whole? I don't know, but I mean, Joss Whedon writing Batgirl, I'm totally down for that. Well, so oh, Jessica ahead. Jastain or Bryce Dallas Howard? I want Jessica Chastain. You're going that old. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I hope so. Okay. I, I mean, there's nothing wrong with those are fantastic look, actresses. I, I think that these characters, especially the DC characters, mm -hmm. are are better served mm -hmm. by characters by by people in their 30s. Okay. I just do. I mean, I think that our our culture has sort of devolved. You know, people have gotten younger. Yeah. They yeah. look younger. They feel <laughs> younger. And I don't I don't know if I would believe a, a twenty a character in their 20s should still be Robin. To me, okay. Yeah. Nightwing's you know, like thirty. You know who I, I want? <laughs> Look, I believe Spider-Man: Homecoming that he's in high school, right. and that's great because that makes a giant juxtaposition between him and Tony Stark as yep. Iron Man, who's fifty. So you have a kid who's like 16, 17, even though in real life he's nineteen. He looks like a kid. He is a kid. Let's face it. Even if he's twenty, he's a kid. So yeah, I totally. Uh, you know who I uh, I agree with you about the DC universe. I want to see like I wanted John Hamm to be Superman. Right. Like straight up, I wanted John the Alex Hamm. Alex Ross. Right. Superman. This older Superman to come down. I thought that would have been awesome, but they, I mean, they didn't go that that route. But I was totally pushing. Well, for you it. know what we're talking about, Batgirl. We're talking about Joss Whedon, who's got this kind of a brighter side to him, a funnier, quippier mm -hmm. side to him. That they're adding these elements, and this is obviously this is a second phase to what DC. They're not announcing it as phase two, but this is. This is technically like the next stage of like they announced Nightwing, they announced Batgirl, they announced Gotham City Sirens, mm -hmm. all these different films that weren't originally in the original announcement two years ago. Now Flash has gone away. Let's get into the next subject. I'm calling it the brighter and shinier DCEU is coming soon. So afterward of the new brand new Batgirl and Nightwing, along with a brand new Batman trilogy that's coming from Matt Reeves, plus the upcoming brighter and shinier Superman that's going to be in the hands of Matthew Vaughn, what does this mean for the old DCEU? I know it just really literally only started. Now, 
uh, is it all a big waste of time? Are they going to figure out a way to salvage what they've already done? And will they create a big event out of the change that is coming? Well, I've got a theory that I'm excited to share with you. Mm. And I, th I think it makes sense for both the small and big screen. So, I mean, my theory is basically what a lot of people guessed and a couple of people have been saying already online. Now, we don't have a Flash movie coming. And we've been talking about, like, if you're going to have a Flash movie, you've got to make it a big event, a crisis level event, something that beats the television series. Like, you have a television series that's in its third successful season. It's such mm -hmm. a fun show. How do you level up and make a big movie? Well, you have to do a Flashpoint or a Crisis. You have to show the infinite Earths. You've got to show the television universe, Flash. You have to show the television universe, Supergirl. You've got to show the young Bruce Wayne, maybe from Gotham. You can show all these different worlds. That's part of what the magic of the DC comic books is. Yeah. I'd love to see the DC Cinematic Universe take advantage of all of that history of the comic books, and by using that, use Flash to create a new universe, open up a newer universe, combined universe, where whatever the events that happen in Justice League, the movie, there's going to be something that forces the Flash to do something drastic, and the end of the, this is my guess, the end of the Justice League movie is going to have a brand new DC cinematic universe. A brand new universe mm. that still has Henry Cavill as Superman, but maybe some things didn't happen the way they happened in the older DC universe. We're still going to have Gal Gadot as Wonder Woman. I don't think we're going to have Ben Affleck as Batman anymore. I think there's going to be something, something big is going to happen that changes the overall tone mm. and texture of the DC cinematic universe. Now, that's a big idea. I don't know if they're going to do that, but that's my guess that has to happen. They have to do something big to change a lot of the things that they've already established. Now, what are your thoughts? Let's go with you, Jeremy. What do you think? I, I, I like these theories. I like hypothesizing. And, you know, that's, that's a big theory right there. But I've also thrown that theory out there where it's like if things get – so if they lock themselves in a box in a corner production-wise, they don't know where to go, they do have a character that can unwrite, rewrite, and parallel write things that may have happened, make them not happen, make things happen a little differently. It's a very advantageous thing to have. You have the Flash. I do like your take where, at a point, it would be neat to glean in on uh, the, the Warner Brothers, like the TV uh, versions of Supergirl and the TV Flash, because the cool thing about the comic books is everything out there it still all happened it's just on different realities and different earths i i as someone who has thrown out that theory before i think it's completely possible i don't know if they're there yet but seeing as how we now have joss whedon writing a, a batgirl uh movie which is totally different mm -hmm. than what we've had before I got to think that you now have an incontinuity way to write around that and be like well this is why it happened so It'd be interesting. It would be huge. It would actually blow my mind if I saw them do that so early in this Justice League movie. Right. But y you got to, I mean, at least be like, eh, good you went there. You know, <laughs> you took the Flash and you rewrote shit. I think well, that's really I cool. mean, if Superman shows up back from the dead in his black outfit fighting the Justice League halfway through the movie. Right. That's pretty big. Yeah. And you're only at the hour mark. Right. Where does it go from right, here? Right, right, right. You know? Totally. Robert. Well... <laughs> Here's the thing that, that, that I, I'm a James Bond fan, and if you have watched the James Bond movies all the way back to Dr. No, Dr. No and From Russia With Love, the first two Bond films, were fairly serious spy thrillers. Uh, Goldfinger sort of changed it up. It mm -hmm. got a little wacky. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got Pussy Galore's Flying Circus. Mm -hmm. You have Aura Goldfinger. You had Odd Job, the first real, well, there was Red Grant and... But, but it changed without saying we're, we're, we're going to make a course correction with the Bond franchise. I don't see as why can't people be funny and serious at the same time. Mm -hmm. I think that the transition will be slower. I think we'll see it gradual. It'll happen gradually over multiple films. And the same way that suddenly Deadpool changed up the mutant universe over at Fox. Uh, no, one, no one cared. They're just like, hey, you can get a Deadpool movie and you can get a Logan movie. You know, within the same... 365 days, really, a little bit more. But I, I would like to see the DC Universe take that approach where we can get a more lighthearted film. We can get something that isn't as serious. But the Justice League, I always took the Justice League very seriously when I was a kid. So I want, I want Justice League movies to be, they can be funny, people can crack jokes because people aren't somber all the time. Mm -hmm. But I also would like to think that they're serious world defining or universe shaking movies, but you can still do a, a Batgirl that has the, the quips. 
I think you're going to get, like, they're fighting dark side in an entire planet. I mean, it's, it doesn't get bigger right. than the Justice League's villains that they're fighting. Not, right now, we've just seen Parademons, but we know that Steppenwolf and Darkseid are behind that. So we're going to get not only that, but probably the introduction to the new gods. It's a jam-packed Which is, they're movie. wacky. I yeah. mean, the, the concept of the fourth world, there's just wacky. We've talked about the Black Racer. Yeah. He's on skis. Yeah. He skis around the universe. And he causes your death if he catches you. <laughs> it's just amazing. you got to avoid the Black Racer. Can I, be, can I be the Black Racer? Is that my superhero name now? Because that's really cool. I want to ski think, I want to ski across uh, the universe. I think you're the Glue Master. Oh, the man. The Glue Master. Um, well, what do you think, I, I really want to see a Flashpoint story. Um, I know we got to see it uh, this season in Flash, especially the beginning of season three. Don't we here. see it every season in Flash? The problem with yeah. Flashpoint is they spent one episode in Flashpoint. I agree. So that was that was my biggest. We have twenty three episodes in the Flash. You have twenty three hours of storytelling that you have at your disposal. They do one episode of him in that reality. They could have spent half the season in there and then see him get out of it. But now they're doing a different story now. Now he's going to go in the future. Barry's like, I'm going to go in the future to save the day. That's what Barry Allen does. He screws things up. He travels through time and messes things up when he shouldn't, but that makes for great storytelling. So if they can do a whole film on just Flashpoint, spend a couple, two, two and a half hours on that, I would love to see that because, like you said, of all the different Earths, they're fun to explore, all different realities. I mean, even in Flash television series, we get to see alternate versions of Barry, alternate versions of Cisco, like different versions of the Vision. I mean, they're really cool characters to see. Um, so I hope that we get more of that. Wouldn't uh, that be cool if the this. Justice League ends with, with you know, Darkseid just basically destroying Earth and the only thing left is Flash has to go through time right. and yeah. alter <laughs> time and then it ends with this like weird new utopian slash sort of not grim and gritty where Batgirl's flying around. You're like, what's going on? And then that's to be continued in the Flash movie. Yeah. And we get like all these different parallel worlds where Barry's trying to, you know, co course correct it. And then we end up with the new DC Cinematic Universe. That's never going to happen. But <laughs> what I think will happen is they're going to use the Flash to fix the DC Cinematic Universe. Mm -hmm. And it's going to happen in the Justice League towards the end. I think that's what the reshoots are going on. They're like, look, we've got a new idea. We've got, we've got all these different people who are coming on board. We've got Matt Reeves. He wants to do a trilogy of Batman stories, and he wants to do it his way. We got Matthew Vaughn. He wants to do his Superman. He wants to do it his way. So we've got all these big directors coming in with their own versions, Joss Whedon of Batgirl. We've got Nightwing now. We've got all these different versions of these characters that weren't part of the older crew where we're like, huh, what happened to that Flash movie? It's off the schedules. It's off the books. Mm -hmm. Where's that Batman movie? Nah, we're working on it. We What? I thought you already had it done. I thought there was a script. Nah. Too much stuff has changed for you to think that it's going to keep going the old way. You got to think about what are they going to do to change it and make it make sense. You have that one character who can actually do it in a way that actually makes sense, not just to comic nerds, but to all of us. Well, that would require somebody at the top being able to make such decisions and be so creative. And <laughs> yes. I, I don't know. I mean, the more they keep announcing these movies, whether it's Black Adam, whether it's Batgirl, whether it's like whatever seems to stick, let's just throw mm -hmm. enough at the wall and whatever doesn't fall off, we'll make. Well, I, I mean, mean, it's it's obvious that there are changes up top. It's obvious that some of the people who were in charge maybe four or five months ago are not in charge anymore and are not making any of those decisions though they might seem to like be showing up at panels and things, they're not in charge anymore. Mm -hmm. There's other people who have taken over and are leading this new version of the DC Cinematic Universe and are making these calls, Nightwing, Batgirl, brand new Batman. All these things, that's what's going on right now. Whoever it is, they haven't announced it yet. It's not up to me to announce it. So it's like, eventually we're gonna find out who these people are who are actually in charge of the new, whatever you wanna call it, phase two of the DC Cinematic Universe. Wouldn't it be cool if it was Kevin Feige? Yeah, it's not him. <laughs> but I think it's something Too I think power. it's something to be excited about because you know, it's like everyone gets their chance to do different things, and right. they might not do the right thing, and they might have, uh, you know, made one too many bad decisions, and they have to step down, and someone else takes over, and they're like, "I've got some new ideas. Let's recharge it this way, and this way, and this way." So I think that's what's going on, and we're going to see that. I think a lot of us are going to be really excited about what happens with Wonder Woman. I'm really excited about what they're going to do with Just League, but I'm more excited about the future of the DC Cinematic Universe than the past. Especially if they go the auteurist route. I mean, Joss Whedon is an auteurist. You're getting, yeah. he's a writer-director. You're getting a certain uh, vision yeah. from him as opposed to some generic, let's hire a, a, a shooter, let's hire a, a director and yeah. put him or her in place. Matthew I mean, Vaughn I, is the same. Same, Ma Matthew Vaughn has mm. definitely become an auteurist. And um, Patty Jenkins, to a certain extent, is as well. And they've got track records doing very interesting films. And I think that's what these, 
let's let's make good movies and figure out how they fit together later. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know? I agree. Yeah. You know what looks like a good movie, guys? Spider-Man Homecoming. Let's talk about the beginning of Spider-Man Homecoming. Now, Sony and director John Watts have recently revealed that the beginning of the brand new Spider-Man movie starts right after the Avengers Chitauri fight in New York, showing uh, Michael Keaton's vulture character, Tomes, and his salvage company being turned away from salvaging some of these wrecks in order of, I don't know if, if Tony Stark owns damage control, but they like mm. somehow got the rights to this, which pisses off Tombs. I bet he was like counting that money. Then it cuts away to Civil War, where we see Peter Parker traveling to Germany, wearing his brand new Spider-Man outfit. That's right after the credit sequence. So that's what they said. They said, look, we are literally establishing this new Peter Parker in no uncertain terms in the Marvel Cinematic Universe by tying him directly and tying in the side characters like the Vulture into not only the Avengers, you know, Chitauri War in, in New York City, but also mm -hmm. Spider-Man's appearance in Tony Stark's Spider-Man outfit in Germany, and then him kind of hanging out in Germany after the fact. So I think that's great, and that's a great way to establish Spider-Man within the first five minutes of the movie. You don't need Uncle Ben. You don't need the origin story. You don't need any of that, and yet it firmly entrenches him in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Jeremy, what are your thoughts on the, this yeah, reveal? Yeah, I, I think it's great because, uh, like you said, we don't need Uncle Ben. We've seen the Uncle Ben thing a few times just in the past few years, and just that dialogue he had with Tony Stark in Civil War where he was like, "Then when you don't act, then it is your fault because you could have done something, and that is the power responsibility phrase just in speech form so it was like it, it's the same feeling you know so we know what happened to uncle ben i think it's great because it also puts um puts context to vulture's line michael keaton when he was like guys like stark they don't care about guys like right. us it's like oh okay so he kind of screwed him out of his contract and so he wants money so he's gonna hose over stark because he knows this guy's an avenger you know it's mm -hmm. like oh that is iron man so by taking on stark he is by proxy taking on the heroes and so uh, when Tony Stark's like, oh, don't worry about the, the flying monster, man. We have people who handle this kind of thing. It's right. like, right. obviously you're not handling it, <laughs> yeah. so I, I'll handle it for you, Pops. You take totally. a seat. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll do your work for you. But I think it's great. Um, it establishes that he is a part of the universe that we already knew. I mean, I would argue that Spider-Man Homecoming started in Civil War totally. in the movie that we saw. You know, So the fact that it takes place right after that, that that's a good place for it to take place because if it didn't, it's like what happened in between. Like what did he do mm -hmm. in the subsequent year or so that he's been? I know he's watching the YouTube video of him wrapping up Ant Man. Someone filmed that. I don't right. know who, <laughs> right. but someone was there with a the cell phone. Like hell yeah, Hawkeye. you know. Yeah. 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 Hawkeye. <laughs> Hawkeye's like, well, whatever. I got. I don't have much to do here, what? so I'm gonna. I shot all lot of arrows. arrows. Yeah. Right. right. So I think it's a cool call. I think it's a great call, and I'm forever looking forward to Spider Man Homecoming. It's my movie of the year same here David. Wow. summer summer at least if not so, star wars yeah. um i'm just happy to hear that they talk you know all the controversy about how this is iron man 4 and there's so much tony star yeah but they have come out and said that it's about the kids mm -hmm. that's the main story it's about it's about spider-man which is great and i guess they they just have to they have to reestablish that this is where spider-man's living now because we've seen him what in the last 16 years this is the third uh, iteration of spider-man that we've had mm -hmm. so it's been a lot of different spider-man you know you have people always mention my mom my dad they go see these movies too and sometimes I ask, like, why is this? Why is there a new Spider-Man? Well, I think there's so much Tony Stark, so much of this ingraining you in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Like, hey, this is a part. He's a part of this. Now, remember, I loved it was Doctor Strange with the first new Marvel Studios intro. Remember how it shows the clips mm -hmm. yeah. of the different oh, movies yeah. in the intro? Yeah. I love that. It's kind of like, no, this is us. So if yeah. you see Logan, which was excellent, Logan just has, excellent. you know, Marvel. It just has Marvel and it has um, Fox. That's all it has. When you go see Doctor Strange, you see Thor Ragnarok. This is part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe with Avengers. I love that they put their stamp on it so you know what you're seeing. They're just doing this more more with uh, Spider-Man right now. Yeah, they're burning him into yeah. the actual the universe that yeah. exists. He has a new home. How about you, Robert? Well, you know, I feel the same way. I think, uh, again, that's what makes these Marvel movies so much fun is like the comics. Once you fall down that comic book rabbit hole, it's the interconnections of the books that become part of the joy of, of being a comic fan. Mm -hmm. And they've really figured out how to do that with these movies. These movies, look, Ant-Man works as a great standalone film, but there are these little connections to the Marvel Universe that you have in those films. Same with Doctor Strange. Doctor Strange was not burdened with, with, oh, we have to have it in continuity with the other films, but there is continuity with the other films. And I think, why not 
I love the idea that they've decided to have a, a, a mentor-student relationship, a father-son relationship mm-hmm. with Tony Stark that Spider-Man doesn't have because his father's not there. Neither is Uncle Ben. And I think that's a great way to go. It makes the character fresh. It does something we haven't seen before. And the the comedic element there between Tony Stark and, and Spider-Man is hilarious. I mean, mm-hmm. and then you get to watch them team up. I mean, look, when I saw that first shot in the trailer of Spider-Man swinging and Iron Man flying, and now you're watching Spider-Man and Iron Man trying to keep that ferry together. Mm-hmm. I wish I didn't know that. But the <laughs> fact that it's there, I'm like, I am all in. Yeah. I mean, there's such... You cannot deny the joy that these movies are imbued with. I mean, there's so... There's just so much fun in them. And they never they never cease to... I sit in those Marvel movies with a huge smile on my face. And what? how many movies can you say that about? Mm-hmm. Not many. I mean, it seems like there's not a lot where you, the, you watch it from beginning to end. I think Lego Batman was the last film that I saw where <laughs> I was like l- literally enjoying the movie from the very beginning all the way to the end. I was like, that was t- a solid film. You can tell that the people that are making them love... The product that they're yeah. putting out there, right. they, they love the material. They do their research. I mean, when you say Lego Batman, there's so much history from everything from the 1960s Batman to Batman the animated series. Mm-hmm. I mean, Billy D. there's Williams so much Harvey Dent. Yeah, there's right? so much love yeah. in there. I mean, you really have to do your research on that. Sometimes when you yeah. see some another superhero film, you're like, do they actually like what they're doing? Right. But they just kind of said, hey, this is how we make money. Let's get this made. Let's. Do it. I know it's all about making money, but if you can have somebody that loves it and wants to make money at the same time, bonus. Yeah. Well, that's the world we live in, and I think that's we're seeing more and more people that grew up as sweaties, you know, we, we, <laughs> like we all were. Sure. And you're watching them ascend to these positions of power, and when they're given the reins, I'm even seeing people like Weiss and Benioff over at, at Game of Thrones. I mean, the fact that they got Game of Thrones on TV, that's an mm-hmm. amazing thing. And the fact sure. that they've made it yeah. as cool as it is, yeah. it's because those guys... They were sweaties. Oh, yeah. They're like, yeah, I'm going to make this fantasy series. But in the wake of Lord <laughs> of the Rings, they were smart. Mm-hmm. And now we're seeing that with the Marvel Cinematic Universe and hopefully now the DC Extended Universe. It's great. Definitely. It's Let's great. talk about someone who wasn't that smart this week. It was Ghost in the Shell. <laughs> it's a box office bomb, ladies and gentlemen. Unfortunately, Style Over Substance is the live-action version that de- debuted this weekend. Based on the beloved anime classic from over 20 years ago, Rupert Sanders' flat and listless direction could not elevate this movie adaptation, and it becomes a series of colorful landscapes with a bunch of people walking around with cool view screens on their faces. Audience did not go to see this film as it grossed only $19 million at the box office. Now, this is my opinion, what I just said. That's how I feel about the film. I was incredibly disappointed with Ghost in the Shell. I had really high expectations, high hopes for it, all the trailers, everything about it. It looks really cool. Guess what? It looks really cool. Literally, I was blown away at the future kind of hybrid, Blade Runner-y, kind of really cool fifth element, everything blended together. It's a great cinematic future scape uh, if you want to have that in the background and then maybe you know watch another movie that actually has some kind of story that is worth watching. I, I feel like... Everything that was great about Ghost in the Shell is like just a shell in this film. It's like it's a hollow adaptation. And unfortunately, it really it kind of rings out not just in the simplification of the script where they were like, well, we don't want to get too deep. Sorry, that's what Ghost in the Shell is all about. If you don't want to get too deep, you screwed up. You ruined the whole idea of making adaptations of something mm-hmm. like this for adults. You screwed up. And then secondly, you just didn't direct the characters, the actors correctly. There's no emotion in any of them. I don't care if they're robots or humans. Nobody is really there. Everyone's collecting a paycheck and everyone's kind of going through the motions. Henceforth, you're never invested in any of the characters or the story, which goes from interesting to you know medium to boring and listless at the end. Where I mean, to, for myself, it's an incredible, horrible adaptation. So I wasn't bummed that it didn't make that money. I don't want to see a sequel. That's my feeling about it. But what does this mean for other adaptations that we've been hearing about for years? Like we just recently heard that Jordan Peele was offered Akira to do that live action <laughs> film of Akira that they've been trying to do for more than 20 years. Is it 30 years now? Mm. My feeling of of these adaptations, whether they're good or bad, is they don't really matter that much because guess what? Nothing's ever going to take Akira away from me. Nothing Mm -hmm. takes away Ghost in the Shell. I can always watch that like I did two months ago. I watched it again. And yes, I think it is a good film. Some people are like, well, Ghost in the Shell isn't even that good of a movie. Well, that's your stupid opinion. I think it's a great film. David, what, do you, what are your thoughts on Ghost in the Shell bombing at the box office? Whether you saw it or not, what do you think this means for Akira? No, I, I saw it, and I think I might have enjoyed it a little more than you, Schnapp, but at the same time, it, it didn't have that... It didn't leave me with that same wonder, that wonder that I had when I first saw it back in 95. I was 11 years old. 
when I watched this. Maybe this is probably a bit much to see as an 11-year-old, but it got me curious because I didn't understand it. I saw Akira soon after that, Akira. I still didn't understand that because I don't understand post-World War II Japan. I'm not Japanese. I don't understand their culture and their subtext. I don't know their context. So that whole series brought me into being a historian. I got my history uh, degree in undergrad. I wanted to know more about history, and especially World War II became my uh, uh, focus. You know, I wanted to know more about why Jap Japan, Japan has the, a certain mindset you know, and maybe want to learn. This movie had none of that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to get into all like, the racism thing and all stuff about like right. miscasting. That's, that's beside the point. It just didn't capture the culture right. uh, from what it came from, and that was the biggest thing that it was missing. And for future adaptations, we're talking about Akira here, it's going to definitely hurt that. Just like when Assassin's Creed came out, I wanted that to do well so badly, not just because I'm an Assassin's Creed fan, because I want to see Halo. I want to see Gears of War. I want to see Bioshock. I want to see The Last of Us. I want to see all those adaptations besides Resident Evil made into feature films. And because one version of that struggled, now we're probably not going to get uh, as many uh, adaptations in the future. I agree. I'd love to see Dishonored. I'd love to see. There's so, so many amazing video games mm -hmm. that can be adapted into a really cool movie. That has yet to happen yet. Robert? Well, I think you hit the nail on the head, which is that it's a cultural problem. And I think that, look, when you're looking at, like, Matsumoto Leje, who did Gal the Galaxy Express universe and was involved with Space Battleship Yamato, and there, Skydance is talking about Chris McQuarrie's doing battle, Space Battleship mm -hmm. Yamato as Star Blazers. I don't think American audiences are necessarily uh, attuned to the idea of putting a bad sense of whimsy. Mm -hmm. It's like people are always saying to me, why do you love the movie Amelie so much, the French film? And I'm like, I really like its sense of, of whimsy, of its unreality. And the Japanese have sort of a special relationship with machines. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they, they imbue them again with, with life mm -hmm. and a soul and a spirit. I mean, you look at our movies like Blade Runner or Westworld, it's all about sort of the Christian soul that, mm. that inhabits these, these robots or these machines. But in Japan, it's different. It's, it's machines have a soul, but it's not based on Judeo-Christian belief. It's, it's the machine soul is unto itself. Mm. You know, it's other. It exists on its own plane. And I don't think that's something that the Ghost in the Shell movie really got. Not at all. They wanted to turn it into... If anything, they're trying to make it more Blade Runner esque. You know, I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. You know, and right. and and it's not like that. It's kind of like when they tried to translate the Grudge after the Ring was so successful. In Japan, if you do something wrong in a house, that spirit stays there forever. It doesn't go away. Like three hundred years later, you move in, your ancestors are still watching you. Mm -hmm. You don't get away from that stuff. You're doomed forever. And we don't have that here. And I think that that's prob. Uh, look, if they make Robotech. It's not, you're not going to have Lin Min Mei singing. You're just not going to do that. It's, they're going to try and make it more Americanized, and it's not going to work. You know, I'd even say, unfortunately, Ghost in the Shell doesn't even work mm. as a Blade Runner light. No. Because, because they simplify the story so much, they even start in a deeper context and then keep simplifying it until it's, it's, it's the end. It's like, I'm a bad arms dealer guy. You're like, really? Is that where the story <laughs> just went to? I mean, I'm not even bringing in any of the casting decisions or any mm. of the other screw-ups. I'm just talking about just simply from a very basic storyline and acting standpoint, it's a horrible mess. <laughs> Jeremy. Yeah, you, you know what's funny is even uh, if they... I feel like you can go a different direction with a property and still make a good story that uh, fans of the property will be like, yeah, I'm on board with it, but you also have to bring on people who have never heard of it in their entire lives. You can't just have a fan service film for the sake of a fan service film. No one made Iron Man. Like, Marvel Studios did not make Iron Man thinking, well, the Iron Man fans will be really happy and no one else will be. That'll totally keep us afloat. You have to bring over a bunch of people. If you look at Civil War, the Civil War movie didn't really follow the Civil War comic book really at all. Right. Um, but it still landed for what it needed to do and what it had to do. But I do agree with you. Like, culturally speaking, it's like they, they didn't commit to one side or the other. You know, they, they rode some weird, some weird gray area line where they're like, well, we kind of have a little bit fringe of that. And we have a little bit of that. Maybe we can merge them. But they didn't commit. Like, if they just committed to be like, let's Americanize the heck out of it, it probably would have worked as a cohesive movie a little more than a movie that's kind of... 40% that, 60% that, and we'll see what happens. I mean, the fact is, 
the trailer campaign also wasn't good because right. people watched mm. the trailer and if you never heard of Ghost in the Shell, you're like, I don't know what this is and it doesn't necessarily grab me. It doesn't look good. It doesn't look like the, the, the characters, they don't yeah. jump out at me. It does look like everyone just kind of speaks in a monotone, phoning it in kind of way. Then you see the movie and you're like, yeah, the characters don't grab me. The world, <laughs> it's, the, it's, it's everything you yeah. thought in the trailer. It's, it's, it's the coolest looking world with very with the worst payoff like the worst execution you know it's like yeah. i've never seen such a cool world i wanted to live in but in a movie that i just didn't want to sit through right again. it's like can you know i be I mean? in this world but not with these characters right, can right. we like get them out of the way and Absolutely. let me just go on a vr journey Absolutely. you know <laughs> you know i was thinking what i it, it's like you think about what if they tried to make an american howl's moving castle mm. as mm -hmm. a live action film i don't think we could do that. I mean, maybe Leica Studios could do it in stop motion or something. Mm -hmm. Right. Or or even, you know, Spirited Away or any of Miyazaki's, Studio Ghibli's movies. I don't know how you could translate but them in what America. What you're talking about is blasphemy. I mean, that's what I mean. I feel like it's such, so, all I'm saying in a joking way is that Howl's Moving Castle is so well made that it doesn't, like it why, doesn't why need, do yeah, it? why are you doing these? Like, for myself, hearing J Jordan Peele directing Akira was like, wow, now, if... There's all these ifs that go into that equation. If he's allowed to make his own adaptation, and we already know it's going to be Neo Manhattan, it won't be Neo New York. Right. We already know it's going to be. It's. It's. You they're going to change it. Yeah, Neo Tokyo. Sorry, they're going to change it quite substantially in order to update it and make it now. I think someone like Jordan Peele will be able to take a lot of things and bring them to Akira that are unlike what we've already seen in Akira. Keep the basic shell of Akira but actually infuse it with something that isn't there and wasn't there in the original. Henceforth, you have a more original adaptation. That's my thoughts, my putting my, my projections on what he would actually do. I would actually rather see Jordan Peele just make like 10 more horror films. Right. I thought Get Out was fantastic. I want to see his original ideas. I don't want to see him do somebody else's adaptation and then be shackled with a bunch of weird money and stupid people's ideas. I want to see his ideas. So that's, I'd prefer that, but if... He wants to take that chance and get that like hundred million dollar movie or whatever, and he's gonna he's gonna do something. I think it, like at least let him do what he wants to do. What are your thoughts? I, I I'm just worried. I think our studio executives just scared that people aren't gonna understand the cultural differences or not gonna accept them. You know, in an American, it's not gonna sell as well. I think we're at a point. I know this is an unfair comparison because I'm using the UK to America, which isn't fair because UK to America compared to America to Japan is much different. Yeah. Obviously, we're a colony of the. Of course, it's it's very different. But like when they do, like they're talking about bringing Luther over. Luther's a television series, Idris right. Elba, right. fantastic cop series, very British. Yeah. And they want to bring it over and make it American, you know, because the American audiences will get into it, even though American audiences already watch it when it comes out on PBS or BBC America. So the same thing, it's like just let it be Japanese, let it be British, let it be French, whatever you're going to bring over, just let it be what it is. You, you don't have to have subtitles, but let it have the culture where it's from, like keep the culture, don't take it out. That's taking the soul out of something. Well, it's taking uh, out what makes it special. The, the biggest ghost. example. Yeah. <gasps> yeah, the ghost in the shell. Well, the biggest Maybe. thing of what you're saying, <laughs> Torchwood Children of Earth, the third season of Torchwood, right. <clears throat> five episodes, is five of the finest Fantastic. science fiction television Incredible. episodes ever put on TV. Yeah. Uh, when I first saw it, I'd never seen Torchwood before. I couldn't believe it. Euros Lynn's direction, mm -hmm. the acting, the threat, the dire threat. When Frightening it, when creatures. It, when it's revealed what's really going on, it is so dark. And then it's followed up, oh, let's bring Torchwood to America and let's make Miracle Day, which is basically about a giant urethra that runs through the center of the earth. Mm -hmm. That makes no sense at all. I don't even know what that show's about. It had a great premise, but Again, it got Americanized, and they, they pulled the fangs out of what it was. And I think, look, sometimes you can, you can have things that cross-cultural, like we got you Jimbo, and then we got a fistful of dollars, or mm -hmm. you know, they, they did Unforgiven. Clint East was Unforgiven as a samurai. Star Wars is basically Hidden Fortress. I mean, you can yeah. translate those things, but doing a direct adaptation, like why does, who wants to watch an American Akira? What are they gonna make, what are they gonna make happen at the end? Yeah. You know, if you've read the manga and you've, right. you've watched the movie, how do you do that in America and make audiences go, oh, okay, I get that? Well, you don't. That's why, <laughs> right. that's that's why that's they right. haven't been able to do it yet. That's right. right. Hey, let's get into minor mutations, where I'm just going to list off a bunch of uh, news from the weekend, and then we're going to talk about it. Uh, number one, we've got Gotham's brand new promo. It's got a, a young Bruce Wayne on his journey to becoming the Dark Knight that we want to see him become. Number two, we got Jessica Jones, season two. It begins production in New York City this week. 
Number three, we got Gorgon being revealed in the Inhumans ABC series. I don't see those hooves. Maybe they're going to add them digitally. Um, number four, we got Spider-Man 2099 fighting Batman Beyond in a superpower 3D beatdown. Uh, number five, we've got Liz Olsen is back as Scarlet Witch, and she's in Edinburgh doing some magic stuff. Number six, we've got Iron Fist tracking shows. It was the biggest Netflix premiere yet. Just don't watch the first five episodes. Number seven, we've got Avengers Infinity War behind the scenes showing the Black Order as the villains. That's all right. That's a dude and a bunch of weird stuff that's going to be replaced, but that weird uh, uh, spear that he's got is one of the Black Order spears. Uh, and finally, we've got Madam Hydra is showing up in the live-action Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. There she is. What pops off to you guys, Robert? Yeah, I don't know. It, it all seems sort of mundane to me. I can't wait to see Jessica Jones Season 2. I'm a huge supporter, unlike John Campy, who I know we talked about, mm -hmm. didn't, didn't like it. I love Jessica Jones. I can't wait to see that show again. Right. Uh, bring it on back. And anything to do with Infinity War excites me. But, you know, all this stuff, all of it's like, cool, Madam Hydra. Woohoo. <laughs> I mean, and, and why does everything we see from the Inhumans take place on the beach? I, mean, right? I know they're in Hawaii. It's yeah. like I'm, I'm either I'm either on the block away from the beach or right. I'm on the beach. Or I'm running towards the beach. I'm running towards the yeah. beach. I want to see the moon, man. Show me yeah. the moon. <laughs> None of those guys look like the Inhumans yet. Right. I mean, Lockjaw's big enough to be Lockjaw, but what does he do? Sit on the beach? Yeah. I think he hangs out on the beach. He's on the beach. You know, the Inhumans might be just subtitled on the beach. But, yeah. You know? And I don't know. I'll still watch two of them in IMAX. I will too. I can't wait. Uh, Jeremy, what pops off to you? Yeah, beaches are cool, man. Look at every every promo to Rogue One. It had all the dark troopers on the beach. Totally. You're like, that's a solid vacay promo mm -hmm. for the for the Empire right there. <laughs> like, be a dark trooper. See you on the beach. Um, <laughs> out yeah, on Blu-ray today, by I, the I, way. I got that's it right. on Blu-ray. Did you yeah. go to Target to get the extra disc? No, I was going to go to Target, and then I was like, ah, I'll get the Steelbook. Wait like, a second. I, what I are you talking about steel. extra disc? There's but, an extra disc on the Target. What's uh, on Rogue it? One. Stuff know. that you can watch on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, whatever. Stuff I, just, that I'm very I gotta sure get the three D disc. Like I got the three D Doctor Strange. I totally get it. Still, books are the best. I love. Do you, you know there's a fourth disc that you can get? Oh, oh, here it comes. It's in Hawaii <laughs> on the beach. On the beach. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I know, but you know what I like is Spider Man 2099 fighting Batman. What, what? Where was that from? What is that? That is uh, some friends of mine who do the superpower beatdown. Uh -huh. Every couple months, they show like Darth Vader fighting Batman. Okay. Or they do these weird like mix ups. They oh, had okay. Wolverine Super fighting okay. Wonder Woman last a couple months ago, which was fantastic. If you didn't see that, it's incredibly violent and it was very satisfying. Wonder Woman kicks his ass, of course. And they do it by fans like, who would win? Wonder Woman or, or, uh, or Wolverine? Mm. And they do it by votes. And like, I think Wonder Woman barely won. It was like mm -hmm. 53 to 47 or something. So Spider Man 29 fighting Batman Beyond. This is all in 3D, so it's a little different. I like it. I I like it. Um, yeah, yeah, but I agree with you. I'm like, Madam Hydra, I, I, I fought her a few times on uh, Marvel Heroes on Steam, so that's right. cool. I, that's, that's what I know about her. Uh, let's see. What else? Jessica Jones. I'm with you on Jessica Jones. I, I enjoy Jessica Jones. I think the only thing is I'm going to miss David Tennant as hey, Kilgrave. you all purple. You look a little like the purple man you know, from Jessica yeah, Jones, dude. man. What can I say? I got my Kilgrave on yeah, right, right now. Jessica, <laughs> get back here. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but he was like, he was arguably the best thing that I've said. It was like Loki and him oh, are yeah. the, and Wilson Fisk from uh, Daredevil. But yeah. the point is, the Marvel uh, Netflix has the best consistent villains. And I mean, Je um, Kilgrave was one of the best I had ever seen. Other than that, yeah, I'm like, Iron Fist, I haven't seen it because, yeah, even the reviewer listens to people. <laughs> and when I'm like, I, I would love to sit through about 12 hours of television, but. A lot of people are like, skip the first five. I'm like, I'll yeah. play Zelda Breath of the Wild some more. Yeah. That's good, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm farming those shrines on there. And, but honestly, you're not missing anything. Isn't that weird to be like, if, just skip the first five hours yeah. and skip you're like, that first you'll catch half. up. Yeah, first you'll catch up really quickly. I want to see a 13 Reasons Why uh, Stranger Things crossover. Can we do that? Mm. Yeah, so that's such a good show. That's such a, great a good show. show. That's a great show. Yeah. It's, it's, so good. It's the best show that I have yet to review. But it's it's great. great. I just yeah. haven't done it. No, no. Of time. Yeah, I'm same here, man. I'm gonna jump on that train probably this weekend. So. <laughs> right. Team drama. Every, every, fine. Everyone's telling me you got to be wise. Like, eh, easy, man. Yeah, I'm trying to still got to watch the last episode of Legion. Yeah, easy. people are like, why haven't you watched them? Like, I have. <laughs> you mean review it? That's yeah. different. That's yeah. a totally <laughs> different thing. I have totally. watched <laughs> things I haven't reviewed yet. I have watched things you've never dreamed of. What? Uh, but uh, yeah, that's that's what jumps mm -hmm. out at me is Jessica Jones and Spider Man 2099 fighting Batman Beyond. <laughs> David, how about you? For me, it's got to be Liz Olsen and uh, Scarlet Witch in Edinburgh because when I was in Edinburgh with my dad uh, about a year ago when mm 
mm-hmm. a father son trip. Did you golf? We did golf. It was a golfing trip. That was oh. like, yeah. Oh. But we did we did we did do some traveling though. We went to like Inverness and nice. uh, Glasgow and did all these places. Did you do places. the Midlands tour? We didn't do we didn't do a lot of tours. Yeah. We just, just kind of drove around on our own and just nice. like you know went to different castles and saw did the you see saw Connor the McLeod thing. of the Clan McLeod. No, I saw nice. Loch Ness though. Oh yeah, <laughs> I, I went, went to Loch Ness. I, 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 I didn't see the monster, but I saw Loch Ness. So we went uh, in Edinburgh, of course, is Edinburgh Castle. All this fantastic history to see, this great history. Oh, yeah. The first thing I wanted to see is like, hey, is there like this like Panera type place where uh, J.K. Rowling yeah. first got the idea to write Harry Potter? It's called yeah. like the Elephant Bar or yeah, something like that. Yeah, we sat at their table. Yeah, so yeah. we went there first before <laughs> we even went to the castle. Like, where do they write Harry Potter? <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that's awesome. what I want to know. So uh, it's cool. And she's doing course, magic in Edinburgh. I was going to say, cool. you're, if, if you go there and you go to that place, you'll see at least three or four sweaty Potter people with their like backpacks. Yeah. Yeah, and making the journey. I was like, look, there's, <laughs> there's another little Potter person. Go, I've got my wand. And I was like, why don't you go sit over that table? That like, I'm going to. I was like yeah. so excited to make fun of them. The place was packed. I was like, yeah, no, it's, it's definitely it, mm-hmm. Edinburgh is a great place to go. I'm telling you, if you ever yeah. get a chance, it's magical. You see where JK got all these crazy ideas, like just walking around that mm-hmm. crazy. Everything's built on top of itself, like these weird corridors, like your crazy steps that never end. You're like, Jesus, how many more steps do I have to go up <laughs> and to if get to the fifth? If you're level? a Braveheart fan, they have, you know, there's when you walk into the castle, there's like a statue of Robert the Bruce and mm. William Wallace. You know, so you get all that history there. It's, oh, and there's uh, William Wallace's original castle. Yeah, we, we, that's what I was saying. Yeah. We went on this Midlands tour, drank a lot of whiskey, got a lot of whiskey. Yep, there's all I, these different yep. places to get incredible. I went whiskey. to Aberfeld. He had a. 29 year old single malt scotch. Mm. Wow. Can you shoot up like in train spotting? <laughs> did not shoot. I did not try that. Did not try that. Robert, we're talking about drinking. Well, it's true, but it, they, Edinburgh's <laughs> where they where uh, rent boy oh, comes I back know. and lands. Oh, okay. Train oh, spotting yeah. too, which is fantastic. Train spotting too is fantastic. So good. We're, we're getting a little off heroes, but definitely check out <laughs> train spotting too. And it takes place also in Edinburgh, which is a great place to visit. And it's also really fun to see the mm-hmm. Scarlet Witch doing yeah. crazy stuff there. Yeah. Can't wait for Jessica Jones myself. Season two, I love Jessica Jones, so I'm really happy to see that there doing and daredevil season three and they got punisher picks have popped up online so mm-hmm. you know we're going to be getting some really cool new netflix stuff coming up very soon you know iron fist eh, well and so then much. the date for the defenders was released oh what's that what, august. It's, it's august it's august august 20th maybe? Something, like something like that like it was like there's a viral video that shows like an elevator yeah right? some surveillance video just good Punches yeah. the camera Punch or something. The camera. Yeah. Nice. She's, I didn't she's angry. See that. She's upset. You know what? Robert mentioned there's some uh, news. Seth Rogen and Goldberg just got the rights to do The Invincible it's not, as a movie. It's right? a movie. That's yeah. fantastic. It's Robert Kirkman's kick ass uh, comic book superhero, pretty violent, crazy space opera superhero comic book. If you haven't heard or read of Invincible, Check it out right now. You can get an omnibus, like a giant absolute. I have the version. first big three yeah. versions of that. I need to it's keep It's such going a in. great series. I'm glad to see that those guys who are super talented doing such an amazing job with Preacher. They released a Preacher Two trailer recently. They're on the road. Mm. It looks like the, one of the greatest road trips ever. <laughs> so I'm really excited about that. We're gonna pop off into the Twitter universe right now and starting out with the Twitter questions. We got Jay Miller. Asking, who do you think is a better fit for Squirrel Girl, Allison Brie or Eden Cher from the middle? Well, what do you guys think? I'm going to go with Brie. Yeah, I'm going to go with Allison Brie yeah. also. Me too. Yeah. Me too. I oh, love Allison Brie. Yeah. Across the board, I think Allison all, Brie. all of us love Allison Brie. Mm. She was fantastic in community and anything she's in. Mad so. Men. Yeah. 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 Scream yes. 4. Yeah. I don't know. Huh? She yeah. was in Scream 4. Oh, I, I, like, I do know. She I was, saw that. I was like, wait, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's pretty played it. I'm not 100% sure, but I agree with Jeremy. Yes. All right. <laughs> Next question. We got Joseph Thompson asks, do you see Tony Stark getting his blue cosmic suit in Infinity Wars or Spidey getting the Venom symbiote? Well, I think in Infinity Wars, which actually Jeremy Renner revealed a really cool logo. I don't know if what the official logo is, but Wars, the A had the Avengers symbol. I thought that looked pretty cool. But um, I thought, you know, they're doing a Venom Sony mm-hmm. standalone movie. Mm-hmm. But does that mean that Spidey can't get a symbiote, which doesn't become Venom, it's just his symbiote suit? I wonder if they're going to mm-hmm. still try to have a little fun with that where he gets the black outfit, where he gets, he's wearing the symbiote in Infinity Wars. And then it it's you know it gets eradicated or, or off of him by the time the Infinity Wars is over. What do you guys think? Over or under fifty percent? Is he going to get a, a symbiote suit in Infinity Wars? David, under fifty. Robert, I think under two, under fifty. When does Infinity War come out? 
next year. Yeah, um, I'd say under because it's kind of like when they are now making Superman <coughs> die and turn bad before we really got a nice block of time to enjoy Superman being good. Right. It's like we need to see Peter Parker's Spider-Man like bring in this, the, the black suit in about movie three or four, mm-hmm. but it's too a little too early right now, so I don't think he's going to get it. Yeah, I want to see him fight Scorpion, yeah. uh, Craven, <laughs> Mysterio. Craven. Come on. yeah. I do want to point out, since Hot Toys already does make a figure, the Starburst armor from the House Party mm-hmm. Protocol mm-hmm. from which is a really cool suit of armor. Yeah. I want to see that armor. I mean, we really yeah. didn't get to see it in Iron yeah, Man yeah. 3. I, he's already got space armor. You know, I mean, blue space armor, that's cool, but I'd like to see the House Party Protocol space armor. Mm. But I already own a Hot Toys figure of. Nice question. Do you have uh, Do you have your John Bernthal Punisher pre-ordered? I do. Oh, so do yes, I. Yes, I do. Oh, here and, comes and, Hot Toys and a Spider-Man Homecoming figure. Yeah, yeah. When he's in his, you know, jammies. Is it a, <laughs> is it a <laughs> Scarlet Spider kind of uh, homage? It does look like it, Scarlet Spider. Really Absolutely what I thought of. I was yeah. like, that's Ben Riley, my friend. <laughs> Scarlet Spider, ladies and gentlemen. I have Scarlet Spider statue at home, dude. Scarlet Spider's pretty cool. People are going to hate on him. I don't know. Chris Wood. Woodburn asks, over or under 50% that Ben Affleck plays Batman again after Justice League. I, unfortunately, or fortunately, however you look at it, look, Ben Affleck is a great Batman. We got to see him play Batman in many movies. We're going to see him do an amazing job, I think, in Justice League. We're going to be bummed out when he leaves, but I think he's done after Justice League. Mm. So it's a way over 50% that he does not play Batman. What do you think? That was the hot topic in, I don't know, here was a couple weeks ago. Like People were commenting, like, like, very angry and upset that we kept keep mentioning that about Batman and mm-hmm. Ben Affleck not returning. Like, you guys don't know anything. Where's your proof? Where's your evidence? And while we don't have that hard evidence or hard proof, you got to realize our studio is about three miles away from Warner Brothers. Like, we do hear things. We hear rumblings. Now, whether that's fact or fiction, we won't right. know until that comes Way to the... Way to tell everybody where to find us. I know, yeah. right? It's like, They're all going to come by the door. Wait a second, the map David. Here. Let's don't tell them. Sorry. Um, but, uh, no, I, I hope Ben comes back. I really do. My favorite thing about Batman v Superman is was him, and mm-hmm. I want him to come back. So I'm hoping over 50. All right. Robert. I think over 52 because, look, he had a hard go of it. He had a rough, a rough patch. Mm-hmm. You, know, you know how hard it is to make movies. Oh, and, yeah. and, you know, you work on a movie for two years, and then <clears> basically it goes away in a week, and everybody says it's a failure, and you're, you've got problems with your ex-wife or your soon-to-be ex-wife or your kids or whatever. People don't like they're making sad memes sure. of you. But right. now things are better for old Ben. And I think that <laughs> why <Ben>. not do, <laughs> if you can have a, a, he's a very smart guy, he's, mm. he's made great films, why not do a Batman trilogy? Especially if you could shoot it back to back like the Lord of the Rings mm. films. Why not? He's got a good director in Matt Reeves. And I think that he, if Justice League is a huge hit, which I'm, I'm hoping it will be because I can't wait to see it. Mm-hmm. You know what? A hit, you want to follow up a hit with something else. I mean, why would you walk away? Then again, it might be just too much of a pain in the ass. Well, I have to look at the past as why I believe that Ben Affleck will not be Batman in the future. Michael Keaton walked away after Batman Returns. Val Kilmer walked away after one Batman. George Clooney didn't have a choice. He had to walk away, Batman Mm. and Robin. You had Christian Bale. Everybody wanted him to play Batman for years. And then finally, he got cast as Batman. It was like, my God, you know, Mm. Bateman is Batman. Everyone was like, this is perfect Mm. casting. He did three movies, walked away. Christopher Nolan walked away. Now we've got Ben Affleck. He's been he'll be he'll have played Batman four times. By the time Justice League will be his fourth portrayal of Batman. He'll have been more he'll be Batman more times than any of the other people have ever played mm-hmm. Batman besides Adam West. So whether or not he's going to be the Batman in the Batman movie or not, I would like to see him continue to play Batman, but that's not up to me. It's up to him and all the other powers that be, and I don't think that's in the cards anymore. And I'm cool with that. I, you know, like by the time the Batman comes out, it's like two, three years from now, we're gonna have all these other films that have already kind of set up the course for whatever the new DC universe is gonna be. So I think it's over fifty percent he won't be Batman. What do you think, Jeremy? Yeah, well, first of all, I gotta address the fact that like I just it's a bummer that people get venomous in the comment section, like you know, the, like stop saying he's yeah. not gonna be in there anymore. Yeah, it's like, whoa. A, for me, it's just fun to speculate about stuff. That's yeah. how I go about it. I don't, I don't have no anything proof Finn, whatsoever, man. but yeah. you can bet when I'm with my friends, we talk the same stuff. Differences, cameras are on. That's the only difference. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh but uh over under, I'd say it's Slightly over a fifty percent chance. I mean, I'd like. I mean, it might be my hope because I agree he's a great Batman. Um, and he uh, he just got he went into re- into rehab, right? He just yeah. got out of rehab. He's yeah. Out, so yeah. I mean, things are you know looking better for him. Maybe he's in a better place. Like okay, positivity. Find my center. Let's be Batman. I hope whatever he does is what he wants to do. And uh, I hope for the rest of us that is him returning as Batman. I just wanted to say more lines. Like every time I walk into a bar now, I'm like, I'm looking for a man. He came in on the Kings. <laughs> that was last night. I just say that to anyone. I 
I'm rich. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. you know, I just, got, I'm rich. He's got some of the best lines in the Justice League trailers. <laughs> I mean, look, we all love Ben Affleck as Batman. You know, I'm glad we're going to see him at least one more time in Justice League. That's how I look at him. Like, hey, we got him at least one more time. And imagine if that's such a massive hit and everybody positively loves it. The critics think it's fantastic. Who knows what can mm -hmm. happen in the future? So sure. none of us really know. Uh, finally, we've got, bef before we get to the sweaty question of the week, Lord of the Bricks asks, could Green Goblin be in the future Spider-Man movies or could Green Goblin in the future Spider-Man movies use Vulture's wings mm. as a glider because they look very similar? Well, I don't think the Green Goblin is going to be in any of these Spider-Man films. In fact, they kind of hinted at that by saying, look, ben, Uncle Ben's not in it. We're not going to use any of these other villains that have been in all the other uh, Sp Spider-Man movies. Like I was going to say, Batman's got the best rogues gallery next to Spider-Man. Yeah. He's got the greatest rogues gallery. So there's so many villains that have never been in a Spider-Man movie, we we're talking about Craven. You got maybe some people laugh at Mysterio, the bubble-headed guy who's a special effects genius. Mysterious. You got awesome. Scorpion. Mm -hmm. You've got so many different villains that Spider-Man could go head head to head with. What are your thoughts, Daniel? I'm saying I think it's we don't need to see Green Goblin. If they do, it's going to be a ways down the road. You know, um, I think maybe that's why some of the backlash with even uh, the Joker. I don't think that uh, he was given a fair shot. Um, on Suicide Squad, you know, I think we need to see more of him. I'm looking forward to seeing him in a full, full fully fledged out Batman film to actually right. judge him appropriately. But I think, uh, yeah, they need to go away from that and concentrate. I would love, is it Mysterio you keep mentioning? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, isn't that how the Spider Man miniseries worked? Didn't he like open a portal? That's what got Miles Morales and Peter Parker together. Remember that Sarah Pacelli and yeah, uh, Brian yeah. Michael Bennett with that Spider Man miniseries for Marvel? And they had uh, those guys met up. So maybe we can get into the multiverse stuff with, with them. That'd be cool. Ooh, that'd be crazy. Yeah. Spider Man multiverse. I'm not ready for it. What do you think? <laughs> Anybody? Well, I think I'll tell you something. I, I, I love Craven's Last Hunt. It's one of yes. my favorite Spider Man stories ever. Now, here's a theory I have. If they're going to continue the Tony Stark, uh, Spider Man, Peter Parker relationship, what if somebody wants to get back at Stark and by doing that is going to kill? Peter Parker. Yeah. I mean, it could put a Marvel Cinematic Universe spin on that storyline because I was thinking, why would Craven want to kill Spider Man? Like, is, right. is he enough of a of game for Craven? Mm -hmm. But if there's a revenge thing, if he wants to get back at, at Tony Stark, and that's why he's going to try and kill Spider Man, although Spider Man has no idea why and doesn't know, that could be an interesting twist on the last hunt storyline yeah i and i love that you're bringing up the last hunt storyline craven craven the hunter he's a powerhouse and he has he, he's one of the ones who's like traumatized peter parker uh by burying him in the ground uh i i think spider-man has a lot of dark horse villains that you haven't heard about maybe you know like mm -hmm. maybe, maybe you're like oh, I, I know green goblin doc ock a couple others but there are a lot of villains he has who are very powerful people uh quentin beck mysterio is one of my you know i, I like him but him as a lead villain i can see him as a secondary right. villain but i agree that's a great take that craven the hunter's like i'm gonna mess with tony stark by killing his little protege right that's mm, awesome right. that's really mm. cool that instantly got me more excited yeah. for it that's so tony has no idea him in the marvel cinematic universe oh yeah scorpion's for sure. another character who has to be a side villain right, he's like right, a brutish yeah. dude who's wearing an outfit right basically. yeah like rhino or yeah. any of them yeah but uh, i mean if they do rhino right but yeah, uh, paul giamatti get yeah. him back <laughs> 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 that hot toys thing that they're never gonna make that hot toys rhino thank god no no i knew that they you don't want to waste your money on that what are yeah, you crazy? It is never coming out. What so are you going to get? Do. An Iron, like a super giant Hulkbuster Iron Man or that dumb Rhino outfit that they're never going to make? Hulkbuster has a May 2017 release date. Bam. Save nice. your shekels, buddy. <laughs> oh, man. Save oh. your Close shekels. Close to $1,000. But yeah. I, do, I do agree that the, uh, the, um, Vulture's wings do look like they could have been a goblin glider, but because if we didn't get the green goblin in Amazing Spider Man 2, we might have seen him in this universe. It's less likely because of that, so probably right. not. And they shoved him in that oh, last yeah. movie. It's yeah. like Dane DeHaan. Like, like, Look, I'm a, I'm the yeah. goblin. I'm like, oh, it's like Venom in Raimi Spider Man 3. <laughs> yeah. It's like if he wasn't in it, it'd be a better movie. <laughs> Giant pile of garbage. Let's not get into that. Movie. No, no, all right. No, no, no. Sweaty question of the week. Habanero Tabasco fan asks, How would Marvel <laughs> explain Namor's powers without the mutant gene? Make his father an inhuman or a demigod? Now, we are talking about Namor the Submariner. For those of you who don't know who he is, he is uh, one of the original Marvel characters along with the Human Torch back in the 1940s with Captain America that became the Invaders. Um, he has not shown up really at all yet. In any of, I mean, the closest we've got to him is the man from Atlantis. So, I mean, we do not have a, a Namor the Submariner. We've got, we're going to have an Aquaman. We have got Aquaman, and he's happening, and he's a pretty badass Aquaman. In fact, he looks a little bit like how Marvel had redone Namor the Submariner in the late 90s. They gave him a full beard, and he was badass. Might as well have had some tattoos like 
like Jason mm -hmm. Momoa. So mm -hmm. what are your thoughts about Namor? Inhuman, demigod, what's he going to be? He can either do demigod or, yeah, I guess like kind of like Thor. Maybe make him from one of the other uh, realms, possibly. That could be interesting, you know, have an alternate universe. Or I know DC uses the term metahumans, right. mm -hmm. which is different from Marvel. But since they can't use mutant, maybe use another term like that, enhanced human or something like that, which, you know, gives him the ability to do cool underwater things. But well, see, uh, I mean, Namor also has an Atlantis. And Namor yeah. also has a Tuma. He has all these other villains yeah. from yeah. underwater. I mean, there's a, it's just like it's literally exactly the same as Aquaman, pretty much, almost the exact same origin. What are your thoughts? Except Namor has little wings on his feet, which I've never understood. What are your mm. thoughts about Namor? Well, I think that they can do anything they want with him. You know, they can call him. He he's just an Atlantean. You know, right. he's he he doesn't have to be a mutant. Why does he have to be a mutant? Why why couldn't he have been here all the time? Why can't his people have always been part of Earth? You know, I read this really cool book by uh, Stephen Baxter about this ocean that cracks open that exists under our ocean mm. and it floods the earth the book was called flood it's really wow. cool based on a scientific theory maybe the atlanteans are from deep beneath the stone you know maybe they're knows? from beyond the pacific rim yeah, right beyond that's right they come through the uh, dimensional yeah well, what if like thor's like hey know about these people that might be able to help us out and they're like uh, where it's like oh they're, just, they're, they're right below you by the yeah, way yeah, pacific yeah. rim two wrapped how excited are we come on very yeah, excited really cool. pacific yeah. rim yeah. two yeah. cannot wait what's it called now pacific rim it's not maelstrom yeah yeah, yeah it's not it used maelstrom. to be maelstrom which was a way cooler title now it's yeah. like i don't know revenge or something garbage robo like, revenge yeah i, I just didn't like the, i like maelstrom it's a it's a really yeah cool. maelstrom definitely reminds me of metal storm a really bad the 1990s destruction of jared, jared sin. sin that's in right in 3d oh no that's right in fact that's coming out on blu-ray weirdos so jeremy any, any thoughts on uh name well, yeah, my thoughts on uh, civilization under the ocean. Wi-Fi would suck down there. I can tell you that. Their technology is going to be garbage. But uh, in a world where we have Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch, who are not mutants, right? Yeah. Uh, you can, you know, you can scientifically alter them. You can make them, yeah, a different species, a different race of people. You can do one of a hundred things. You make them aliens. You can make them extra dimensional people. Where you can do a hundred things. They've already done that. They've they've already actually worked around the mutant thing. So I mean, I imagine they're just going to do that. Like Loki's staff. Why not? Loki's staff. <laughs> does a lot of cool stuff, so I imagine it's not going to be a problem. All right, well, I think that is it for episode 103. You've been watching Heroes. Let me get everybody sign off. David Griffin, where can people find you online? You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at GriffinDE. Uh, we had Movie Talk uh, yesterday, uh, talking about 13 Reasons Why. Excellent new show on Netflix. Uh, of course, Heroes, and I'm also going to be on Jedi Council on Thursday. Right on. Jeremy Johns, where can we find you? You can find me at Jeremy Johns on YouTube, Twitter, rest of the universe. You can, yeah, the universe, not the Twitterverse, the universe. And you can find my show, Awesome Tacular, on Go90. It's a lot of fun. Schnepp and I go to comic book stores, talk about comic book movies and the comic books they came from and where they got their inspiration. It's a lot of fun. Check it out. We do a lot more, too. But that's just one of the segments. That's true. There's a lot but of it's segments. It's a darn fun segment. Definitely check out Go90. Robert, where can people find you on? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Burnett RM. You can find me on Instagram at RM Burnett or on Facebook at Robert Meyer Burnett. Although my friend requests are piling up, and I don't know who's like a hot chick bot from Russia oh, those or who best. my real those friend should be. Right? You know, I keep going, and they seem to all have three names. Yeah, and they post bad links on your homepage, which is not good. Yeah, well, not you good. Know so I don't ever friend yeah. them. Yeah, I mean, just I, just follow all of us on Twitter and make it easy. I'm just John Schnepp on Twitter. Become my pal. And uh, you can find me uh, online on Instagram as well. And also my comic book from Dark Horse, Slayer Number 2, comes out tomorrow at all comic shops around the world. So pick it up. It's bloody. It's a road trip from hell. Slayer Number 2 from Dark Horse. I wrote it. Enjoy it. I'll see you back here next week on Heroes. And by the way, check out Collider Nightmares, the return of Collider Nightmares. It's on tomorrow on Wednesday. Check that out. I'll see you next week. Four. Hey, guys. If you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.